For 30 years, the churches of Rwanda have been the only safe haven when bloody civil wars have swept through the country. So it was to the churches that thousands fled when the massacres began in April, urged on by official government radio. And it was to the churches that government troops and militiamen came to violate that sanctuary, to slaughter them with guns and grenades, with bayonets and machetes. It looks like a paradise of fertility and tranquility. Rwandans call it the land of a thousand hills, Africa's smallest nation, and with almost seven million inhabitants, one of the most crowded countries on earth. In a country that is normally teeming with people, there is an awful silence hanging across much of Rwanda today. Hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of innocents have fled their homes, terrified of both sides in a civil war that became genocidal after the Rwandan president's plane was shot down a few weeks ago. Now, waiting in the wings, is a new elite, one that claims it will bring not only peace, but democracy to this benighted country. Rose Kabuya is a major in the rebel army, the Rwandan Patriotic Front. Under last year's failed peace agreement between the government and the front, she was to have become a member of parliament. The Patriotic Front now controls more than half of Rwanda, its army remorselessly closing in on government troops. Rose's job is to win the hearts and minds of a people terrified by a war they cannot understand, traumatized by killings beyond their comprehension. So every member of his family and all his village were killed, huh? You know, a cell. How did you know one guy? His family yeah. and then the whole family. All his broad family. The village. Yeah. Even the village. the village. Yeah. Yes, he's the only one who survived. Out of how many? So, how many was that? She's a manaban. About 600. About 600 dead? Yeah. In one village? With children. With children. It is a conflict portrayed and oversimplified as one of tribal warfare between Rwanda's vast majority of Hutus and its 8% Tutsi minority. Herself a Tutsi, Major Rose Kabuya is out to convince the people, especially these Hutu villagers, that the Patriotic Front will obliterate the ethnic divides that the government has manipulated to hold on to power for 30 years. Mm. To the Hutu villagers, she portrays the rebel army as the best and only chance for peace in a nation now notorious for bloodbaths. First of all, I told them who I am, and I assured them that they shouldn't be scared, they should start their normal lives. Were they afraid of you because you came from the RPF? Mm, there's one old man who said that uh, he was a bit afraid, but the rest said that it's normal they've been meeting some of our soldiers who have been assuring them that there's no problem. Born in exile of parents who fled earlier massacres, Rose and her husband David have been fighting with the rebel army since it first crossed into Rwanda from Uganda four years ago to start its long campaign. We have to give security to our people. You can see most of them are displaced, others are in hiding. So the most important thing that the RPF will do is to secure the people. We've been with the RPF fighting this war for about four years. So if we are not convinced that we are doing the right thing, 
I think we, we would not be here. This is what happens when a government desperate to cling on to power unleashes the primitive fears and ancient prejudices of an ill-educated people. There was no spontaneous massacre. The killing was efficient, well-planned. David, tell me about this woman's extraordinary story. So a group of militia they inherited her with, together with some soldiers, and they all came up, came to their house, and uh, gathered them somewhere with the rest of the population in the neighborhood, and start hacking them. They hacked on the neck, both legs, both arms. With her, she had four children, two died. She has two with her here who are also hacked. And then they realized that uh, pretending to be dead would save them. So they stayed in the dead bodies, in the group of dead bodies for a week. For survivors, there's only the most basic treatment at improvised hospitals. This patient has been uh, uh, injured by bayonet, bayonet, in in. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. In, She's in very grave danger of losing her life. Is that right? Yes. If nothing is done in two days. She can die. Government-backed militias in almost every town and village systematically attacked Tutsis and thousands of others, anyone suspected of opposing the government. It went beyond ethnic violence. Hutus like Dr. Sustain Buchana turned to the rebels to be rescued from the mayhem. But these injuries, in some cases, have been done by their neighbors. How are they ever going to live with them again? Some people have been killed or injured by some neighbors because of ideas from politicians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, otherwise, people live together. The common people live together. The, they share everything in their life mm -hmm. with, um, without a problem. <laughs> Urimu Benshi is one of countless orphans who have watched their parents slain before their eyes in recent weeks and their siblings hacked to death. These children have been orphaned in the past few weeks. There are thousands of them. And there have been generations of orphans and exiles since 1962, when Belgium pulled out from a colony whose tribal rivalries it had exploited to quell and rule the people. In the intervening years, each generation of children has seen other massacres, civil war and brutal repression leaving a legacy of skepticism amongst Rwandans that the Patriotic Front, the RPF, has inherited. It will really depend upon the influence the RPF is going to have in the country. Because when you look at their politics, particularly because they are against that uh, thing of ethnic appurtenance, I think they will manage well for the society. Do you believe the RPF any more than you've believed anyone else? I don't know. I am waiting to see. It is for the cause of future generations that the RPF, like many liberation movements, justifies its fight. David and Rose Kabuya left their baby son behind with family in Uganda to come to fight the war. It, of course, it's a difficult decision to, to leave your child, especially when both parents are going. But again, 
uh, I think I th we both thought that uh, it would even be better for that child if we tried and if we tried to liberate our country. Yeah, I made that for my son and for other sons, for the people of Rwanda, for the Rwandese people. Behind the front lines, there's already a nonchalance amongst patriotic front soldiers. The arrogance of an army that has watched the opposition crumble before it and believes victory is nigh. But the war of words is as vicious as ever. The voice of a desperate government broadcast 24 hours a day, urging its population to still greater slaughter. Preaches that the Tutsi should eliminate the Hutu. The, the Hutu should eliminate the Tutsi, and that the Tutsi should be cleared from the face of Rwanda. What, why is it that it, uh, you laugh so much about it? What amuses you about it? It's because wh whatever they say is so extraordinary. It's not even. It's, it's unreasonable, it's, it's untrue. It's so funny. Those people who have been manipulated, you can forgive them and they come in because uh, you can't punish the whole country. Tito Rutaramara was slated to lead the Patriotic Front in Rwanda's parliament under last year's failed peace agreement. But what's going to stop your soldiers from killing people out of hand if they suspect that they've been involved in massacres? No, our soldiers first are politicized. They know why they're fighting for. They know it. They know our political program. They know that they, they need the unit of the country. Then they, they are politically sensitized. They can't do it. The town of Bayumba is deep in rebel-held territory. But the people here are not its residents. They fled as fighting raged around them. Now a flood of refugees has taken their place. Hutu or Tutsi, they find their lives in the hands of the Patriotic Front. And this gentleman? And uh, he's the Minister, Minister of, of Finance. Finance. <laughs> Comes from this region, Gitarama. Yeah. Amongst the destitute, members of a former elite, the few opposition politicians who survived the terrible slaughter in the capital, Kigali. One of them, the nation's finance minister, was found hiding and almost starved in his home. So tell me, sir, the, uh, the people sitting around at this table, are they Tutsi or are they Hutu or what? Uh, we are mixed, so we can show you who are Hutus. Though not allied to the patriotic front, they argue the movement is now the only hope for unity and for peace in Rwanda. And the others are Tutsi. Four. Yeah. Maybe we will have to put together all our different ideas to build the country. Neither peace nor normality will come easily to this tiny country. Millions are on the move, their families shattered, crops abandoned, possessions gone. They gather together for safety building meager protection with banana leaves from a rainy season that drenches them daily. Then, moving on again, searching for more secure refuge and for international aid agencies that will supply them with food. The enormity of the problem would crush the resources of a government, let alone a rebel army. There's a burning anger in the patriotic front that the UN withdrew most of its armed peacekeepers when the massacres began, yet now considers returning when the Holocaust is over. So from the point of view of uh, food, uh, the point of view of medicine and so on, is that, that is beyond your resources to be able to deal with? Definitely, mm. because uh, the only food we can afford is for our soldiers, and the little medicine we have is just for our soldiers. The Rwandan Patriotic Front has been quite critical of the international community for its lack of action on this, and yet you still rely on them for help, don't you? 
the lack of action is that they, the, the thing they could have done, the most important thing was to save lives. And in the time of need, they didn't do anything. The Patriotic Front has a clear message for the UN and countries like Australia, which may send in troops. It will accept aid and protection for refugees, but it will not tolerate peacekeepers who stand in the way of victory. Are you saying that the rest of the world can now mind its own business and you'll solve your own problems? Well, uh, we, we, we say that we still need the international community. We have got these people who are suffering who need to eat. We've got, uh, well, we need humanitarian aid. In that we can't do But you'll resolve your own political problems, is that what you're saying? Well, I think we can resolve our own political problem. And if we need any help, we call friends and tell, tell them, come and help us. The weapons of massacre are still in the hands of the people. For the panga, the machete, is both daily work tool and the means by which neighbor has killed neighbor for generations. Rwanda has now gone well beyond the brink. Yet a war still has to be won or lost and starvation and disease threaten. There have been reports of the summary execution of militiamen and some accusations that Patriotic Front soldiers have killed civilians, but we've run across no evidence of that since we've been here. For now, the scent of death in almost every village is nauseating, sweet, sickly, appalling. Rwanda is not alone in witnessing what havoc the power hungry can wreak when ancient fears and prejudices are set aflame. But there's something unique about the scale of this catastrophe. If the Patriotic Front and the international community acting together failed to deliver on the pledge of peace and unity, the cycle of disaster must continue into the next generation. <laughs>